Blessings, good evening. Talking to some meditators at lunchtime today. One of these recurring uh, issues that Buddhist meditators face came up. What are we aiming for in meditation? Are we aiming for a state of complete emptiness where there's no thoughts, nothing at all? Or are we aiming to be able to train our thinking mind to understand things and know things? This comes up often because uh, people come to Buddhism, particularly to come and begin practicing meditation because they've noticed the feeling and an experience of discontent in their life. And that's often manifests as a lot of uncontrollable thinking, negative thinking. They're not happy with what's going on in their mind. Too much thinking or the wrong kind of thinking not peaceful, and so on. And actually people have often built up a certain dislike of their own states of mind that they experience regularly. They don't like the way they think, or they don't like the kind of memories they have. And this is part of the discontent and dissatisfaction. And the Buddha pointed out that contentment is forerunner of the arising of states of calm and peace as we meditate. So we have to find some contentment. But how we achieve that, well, we have to use thought as much as get rid of thought. And a lot of our practice involves um, training. training how to think, how to use the what we call the sankhara, the mental fabrications, the mental formations in a skillful way, or to use thought skillfully. Just when you look at, as you meditate, looking at what's motivating you, the, the Buddha said, try and discern the difference between the motivation of craving, which is mental defilement, and stirs the mind up and looking for something. So even that desire for an empty mind or to get rid of all these negative thoughts, stressful thoughts, will usually come from craving, and craving to get something or get rid of something. But the other motivation is skillful desire. You actually have a willingness to practice, to train. The word for this is chanda. Chanda means you're agreeing with yourself to practice, to train to bring up mindfulness and if you're meditating using a meditation object such as the breath you're willing 
to do that. So it comes from having some confidence in the Buddhist teachings that they, they make sense and they'll help you. And it leads on to effort as well. Partly it's a seeking of truth, we call that Dhamma Chanda. Partly seeking of more peace, more feeling of well-being. So it might be what we call Kusala Chanda. But it's the wholesome desire that motivates us in the practice and that's something we have to cultivate to counteract the old habit of always following craving and you know, we know that you sit down to meditate and oh got all these thoughts again <laughs> plagues of thoughts, waves of negative thinking, distracted thinking that undermine our motivation. We have to learn how to deal with that skillfully and bring up the opposite, the, the skillful, the wholesome thinking and the wholesome motivation. Sometimes you see it most, you know, the falling into craving and, and negativity when you're at your weakest. So when you face a particular problem in life, so maybe you have a relationship problem or a work problem, a problem with another person, some kind of disagreement or rivalry or something. Or some, perhaps the, where we're at our most weakest is when we're ill, either injured or ill. Because physically, the lack of uh, energy in our body <coughs> weakens our effort to be mindful, to know our mind. And you notice when you're ill, you, discontent comes up very quickly. Craving takes over. Usually the craving, I just want to be free from this illness. I don't want to feel tired. I don't want to have pain, discomfort. If it's more serious illness, I don't want to die. The craving takes over the mind very easily when we're ill. We don't feel like practicing mindfulness, reflecting on things very much because we're physically and mentally at our weakest. But at the same time, that can be an opportunity where you really learn something very profound and deep. Because you're at your weakest time, or having your weakest experience of the body and mind. It's the time where you can really learn how craving leads to discontent and then employ or use some skillful ways to overcome it. Now, in the time of the Buddha, in one of the most famous suttas, teachings of the Buddha, the Girimananda Sutta, there's a monk who was ill and he was struggling because he was beset by craving, discontent, anxiety, restlessness in his mind. So he asked Verabha Ananda for, to invite the Buddha to come and give him a teaching. So he had some, still had faith, but he was struggling with his own states of mind. And then Ananda told the Buddha, and the Buddha gave him a teaching. This is like you know the greatest gift if you're you're suffering, and if it's a teaching from the Buddha, it's as good as the Buddha coming himself. As the Buddha used to say, "The one who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha. One who sees the Buddha sees the Dhamma." So even if the Buddha doesn't come in person, receiving a teaching from him is just as good. And the Buddha gave these, those ten perceptions to be developed that will help to uplift the mind and give right view and the right perspective on things, change the way of thinking from craving into Dhamma, into the truth and into wisdom. And a lot of those reflections or perceptions are called are very you know, central to Buddhist meditation and Buddhist practice as a whole. 
developing the perception of impermanence, of unsatisfactoriness, of not self, of the unattractiveness of the body, and so on. We're developing all them all the time. They might form the basis for vipassana or insight meditation. But they're also, we say, perceptions that just develop to become mindful of, remember from moment to moment through your day, through your life. <coughs> and particularly, say, when you're ill, turn your mind to the Dhamma rather than getting caught into the craving of I don't like this, I don't want this, which just makes you more miserable. You're, you're already feeling pain and tiredness in the body, then your mind just gets dragged down by that. And if you introduce some of these perceptions, it changes the whole mode of thinking. But you're still thinking. And you, know, you might call it the skillful use of perception, memory, the skillful use of thought, because thought is driven by memory and perception. When you th think about anything, you know, where, do, where do those thoughts come from? Well, one part of the process is karma, old karma. We've thought in that way before, so we have the tendency to think in that way again. So it's like habit. Things we've given importance and significance to in the past will come up again. So partly it's karma, but partly it's also the way you perceive things and what you're looking for, and what, how you train perception, because this provides a lot of the details, the information of our thinking mind. That's why the Buddha encouraged us to listen to the Dhamma regularly or read the Dhamma regularly. Because you're, you're learning, you're educating, picking up information, ideas that this will then guide your perceptions as much as your thinking. So if you focus, like Giri Mananda, you, know, you focus on, uh, say, the perception of impermanence, and anicca sanya, you're bringing your mind to the Dhamma. And that may just be something as simple as just thinking about the nature of feeling, how you know, some, say you're ill, sometimes the pain is stronger, sometimes it's weaker, sometimes you even can feel pleasure still when you're ill, but how feeling comes and goes, changes, how the body, the symptoms of the illness and the body changes, and then of course all kinds of other things in the world around us, how our our own thoughts and feelings change and then how other people change, come and go. It can be the decline and destruction of things, one side of impermanence, isn't it? You, you, you observe the aging process of your body or someone else or how people build things and then those things they build, they fall apart or they buy something some product, and then that gets old, and then they don't use it, or they throw it away. But it can also be impermanence in the other way, like you know, staying here at Bodhi Pala Monastery. At the beginning of the range retreat, I came, and there was the old carport that's pulled down, and then a new kitchen has arisen through one three-month range retreat. So there's a new thing that's also impermanence. Something can arise where there was nothing before. Something can decline and fall away where there was something before. Or maybe in just a few moments, just now I was meditating, I opened my eyes and there was a mother and a daughter, kangaroo, a couple of kangaroos eating the roses outside my kuti. All the roses in bloom look very nice, but then I guess they're tasty for a kangaroo, so they pulled apart about three rose flowers, so those flowers were there, and then they weren't there. In just the space of a few minutes, they disappeared, impermanence. We can see impermanence 
if you're looking and you're noticing and you're directing your mind in that way, you can see it all around you on the outside. You can see it on the inside, in your own mind, your own thoughts coming and going, feelings changing, the physical sensations in your body arising, passing away. And it's bringing your mind to Dhamma, it's keep bringing your mind to wise reflection on impermanence, you might say wise thinking. And what does that do to the mind? Well, it calms the mind down. When you see truth in a very ordinary thing, noticing, say, impermanence, your mind changes, doesn't it? From just being prey to craving, sort of racing, the thoughts racing, and the sort of agitation of craving, not satisfied, not content. <coughs> <coughs> that changes as you introduce the Dhamma and a perception, just one simple perception, say, of impermanence. <coughs> <coughs> and I know monks who have done this as a practice, they're just focused on impermanence all day long, you know, they train themselves. They develop that perception, the sanya, the perception of impermanence, and then just keep focusing the mind on it over and over again until that they're, they're noticing that all the time in themselves and the things around them. So every thought that arises, they're just seeing that thought as an impermanent mental state, whether it's good or bad. The one thing every thought has in common is it arises, passes away. It takes some of the edge, some of the suffering of clinging and identifying with those thoughts because you're seeing them right through from start to finish. Every Whether it's a sort of continuous train of thought or one particular idea or image that arises, pops into your mind, it arises and ceases. And you can keep watching and observing that all day long if you want. And sometimes it's a way the mind does go to a point where it stops thinking because you kind of lose interest, don't you? If you keep seeing thought as impermanent, then the mind gets tired of grasping and craving. And the quality of knowing is established, the mind is mindfulness, alertness, wakefulness of clear comprehension is established. And then the mind can go very peaceful, very quiet, even to a point of emptiness into samadhi, what state of one-pointedness, just by contemplating impermanence. We call this wisdom developing samadhi. So we can use perceptions of thought trained well to a point where they actually, when the mind goes beyond perceptions of thought, at least temporarily. It gives you a new way of looking at all your memories and perceptions and thoughts. You see them as just that. They're just mental activities, things that arise and cease within your consciousness. And there's that sense of letting go, of stepping back. Other perceptions the Buddha gave to that sick monk is perception is a perception of not self. These five candors which we take so seriously and give so much importance to are ultimately, we say they're conditioned things, they're not self. They arise, they pass away. That's what conditioned things do. But if you introduce the perception of this is not me, not myself, the sense of possession and ownership starts to fade. So if you're mindful of the perception of not-self, it's helping you to let go. And letting go leads to a lightness of mind. You feel better, you feel more relaxed, because you know it's just a thought, it's just a feeling, it's just the body. The stress and suffering of, of attachment and grasping fades out by developing the perception of non-ownership of body and mind. Knowing things but not taking them up as self.
and the Buddha also gave you know, these other perceptions right? seeing the, the danger of grasping and attaching to things that are impermanent as permanent things that are not self as self and that can be just grasping at every thought because the danger in or the drawback in grasping every thought is well a lot of those thoughts are not very wise and not very peaceful there's a certain danger there if we don't train our mind, we don't develop mindfulness and insight, we're going to have to be with more suffering. That's the drawback of an untrained mind, an untamed mind. And just seeing that, seeing that from that perception, oh, if I don't develop the quality, say, of mindfulness, insight, then this untamed, untrained mind will keep bringing me suffering. There's a danger there. Leads me to do and say things that maybe hurt myself, hurt others. And just in the same way, you know, we get all these alerts at the beginning of bushfire season. They say, well, be alert. If you see sparks or flames or smoke, we'll be careful and call help and you know, call the fire brigade or put it out because it will spread and it will maybe cause a big fire. Seeing the danger in that. Just the same when you give in to craving attachment, there's a danger there because it leads on to suffering. So you develop the perception of being alert and on, on the lookout for danger in your own mind, in your own experience. Or the perception of abandoning or letting go. You know, people are always asking, how do we let go when I'm angry? How do I let go when I'm worried? How do I let go? We well, have also to develop the perception of letting go, abandoning, giving up that attachment. You have to introduce that idea. You know, perception is an idea. You just keep introducing it into the way you think and look at things. How do I let go of this? I should let go of this. Introducing the idea so that will guide you more in, in developing the qualities of mindfulness, reflection that will help you to let go. You notice sometimes we don't even want to let go. We are happy to, and, and so used to attaching to our worries you know, you think, if I'm not worried, then something's wrong. <laughs> Especially if you're in a position of responsibility, say you're in a family, you're worried about some other person in your family, or you're in a, a job and you're worried about the, the, the job, the business, or the job, or getting the job done, or the people, the co-workers, and so on. You know, we, we look for worries in life, because we identify with maybe a role of responsibility or something we identify. We could even you know, worry about the whole country or even the whole world nowadays because we receive so much information about the whole world. We think, what am I going to do about the world and its problems because there's so much you know, conflict and poverty and disharmony and all the problems of the world. And you... Often when you attach to worry, then you feel, if I let go of worry, I'm not doing my job. I'm not a good citizen of the world, I'm not a good member of the family, or a good member of this workplace, whatever it is, or a fr friendship, relationship maybe. But we have to see, well, worry is suffering, isn't it? In the case of worry, it could be anger, it could be greed, it could be jealousy, it could be anything. We have to introduce just the perception of abandoning. This is not to be held on to because it's suffering. In the case of worry, it doesn't help you solve the problem. Worry just agitates the mind, clouds your thinking, uses up a lot of negative energy, makes it hard to concentrate. But you have to introduce the thought, this should be let go of. And then you work to let go of that or abandon it. If you never introduce the idea of abandoning, letting go, you may not even think of it. You just think it's just normal. A lot of people think 
when you're angry, it's normal to be angry. Oh, all humans get angry. Well, that's not true, is it? The Buddha didn't get angry because he abandoned it. Teachers such as Lumpur Cha and many others abandoned their greed, anger, delusion. So not all human beings are greedy, angry, jealous, worried, fearful. These are qualities of mind that can be abandoned and should be abandoned. But we have to, in our own practice, introduce that idea. Just, oh, this is to be abandoned. And if you keep doing that, then you get quicker at it, quicker to recognize what needs to be let go of. You may develop your own technique, like the monk who was just using the word let go as his main mantra all day long. Oh, just let go of it. Let it go. 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 Until he got really good at it. <laughs> got very peaceful. Abandoning doesn't mean there's nothing left. It just means you're abandoning the cause of suffering, craving and attachment, that way of thinking, those perceptions, you might say. And what's left is the Dhamma, good, useful perceptions, wisdom, mindfulness, understanding, that's left. So it's not that there's nothing left when you abandon. What's left is the good stuff. What you abandon is the bad stuff, the stuff that makes you suffer. But you have to do that, you have to teach yourself, train yourself. So it's another useful perception. Maybe you could get up in the morning and say, what will I let go of today? Because you know yourself, everyone knows themselves, don't they? especially if you meditate a bit. You get to know your character, who you are, what you identify with. So you can almost predict where your suffering will come every day. To do with work, health money, people, whatever it is that you particularly you know, generate suffering in your mind. You can all, already, in, from the beginning of your day, say, oh, I'm going to have to let go of this one. When it comes up, you know, next time I get angry, just let it go, let it go. That's the perception of abandoning, introduced into your thinking, into your, into your day. That's following the Buddha's instruction in the Giri Mananda Sutta. Developing that perception. If you're lying sick in bed, there'll be lots to let go of and abandon. You know, your worries, will I will I get better or not? You know, Ajahn Chah used to say, oh, just let it go. If you get better, good. If you die, okay. Just bring your mind to the place in the middle with mindfulness, equanimity and accept. Okay, if the, I have the Good karma to recover, good. If I don't, if this is the end, I'll keep my mind peaceful and I'll let go of that also. The reason we suffer when we're ill is because we, we only want one outcome, and that is to get better and recover. So of course, as long as that hasn't happened, then we're not happy. Sometimes we blame the others around us, the doctors and nurses, people around us, family members, whoever is looking after us perhaps. Sometimes we blame ourselves, even Buddhists do that. Oh, I made too much karma in the last life, I'm no good, <laughs> so I have to have this illness, this pain, this problem. But we develop mindfulness and then the perception of abandoning, abandon the desire that is agitating the mind and just accept the situation and that may actually turn out to be the cause for you to recover once you let go then often you, your mind feels very light accepts the situation feel light relaxed and more content within itself and then that can help your recovery well the, the same many things like you know, the person the other day who told me, oh, they just got cheated out of $1.2 million. <laughs> Their life savings, all gone. You know, very sad situation, but then because they've heard the Buddhist teachings and they have some of that perception of letting go, it's like, I'm just going to have to let go of my frustration and anger in this one and accept it. Getting angry or Fretting about it doesn't change the fact that it's gone. So might as well let go of the worry.
but you need that perception, that way of thinking to do it. There's a disp dispassion, a perception of dispassion. Isn't it? Often we have a lot of passion for things in life, and you know, passion for the practice is good. Ajahn Chah had great passion, desire to practice, and was very enthusiastic. And that's one of was one of his characteristic qualities. He pulled people along, along with his enthusiasm for the practice, encouraged them, pushed them, gave them some of the uh, reflections and teachings they needed to get through their own suffering. But he had a great passion for it. But also there's the passion for the more negative qualities of life. Greed is often passion, isn't it? Passion, lust, desire for things, desire to be somebody. It's often centers around wealth, producing wealth, getting somewhere, getting on in life, ambition, getting pleasure. That's often dependent on other people, getting the person you want mixed up lust, mixed up with love, relationships, trying to maintain the same level, the same high, the same level in a relationship, the same level of passion over a period of time can get quite tiring and disappointing. So when the passion fades, then we, people move on, separate. This passion comes from mindfulness and seeing the impermanent nature of things. And the mind prefers to be more in a cool place where it's not grasping at everything and expecting so much from life, just knowing the way things are. Things arise, pass away. There's plenty of pleasure to be had in the world, but you know it's impermanent. Because passion without, unguided by mindfulness and wisdom tends to lead to disappointment, doesn't it? and addiction, and frustration. The perception of staying cool, calm in situations that maybe encourage us to be angry, or agitated, upset. Again, some people don't, they think it's not right if you're dispassionate in a situation, they think, oh, you should be more angry in this situation, or you should be grieving, or more sad, or you should be more unhappy about what's happened. Some people don't understand that it's a higher Dhamma. Your mind is in a better place when it's more equanimous, dispassionate. Your thoughts tend to be more wholesome, skillful. You can understand things better. It doesn't mean to say you're, you're inactive or passive, it just means you're a little cooler towards the experiences you have that would normally make you angry, greedy, selfish, whatever. Another one, perhaps a more refined one, the Buddha gave was the perception of you know, not attaching to the world, not delighting in the world. Maybe that's easy to develop at the moment, you know, you just turn the news on and the world is just full of suffering, isn't it? Wars and disharmony, conflicts, disagreements, problems, econ economic problems, social problems. If you watch the news with, with some wisdom and you reflect on it and develop the perception of not delighting in the world, it's quite easy. But actually the Buddha also said in all the worlds, what we tend to do is say, I don't want to be in this world anymore. You hear that quite often. You know, the world is just full of suffering. And then people say, I want something better. I want to be in a better world. So often we aim for heaven, heavenly rebirth. Some people will meditate, they want heaven. But even heaven doesn't last. 
Nibbana comes from beyond the world, it's going beyond the world. It's actually developing the perception of not delighting in the world. <coughs> it's a more subtle one, but still it brings a calming has a calming effect on the mind when you develop it. So the skillful use of wise reflection, perceptions, is very much at the heart of Buddhist meditation, training the mind. And we're not simply trying to empty the mind of all thought. There's a place for that. If you get to one point in this samadhi, then of course thought subsides and maybe you're just knowing one object like the breath. That was the last of those perceptions that the Buddha gave. The perception of the breath. Go to the breath a lot is very calming and it can be a foundation for developing insight into the Four Noble Truths, freeing the mind from all attachment. So there may be times when the mind empties out, but there'll also be the time for developing these skillful perceptions. Actually thinking Dhamma. Using the Dhamma to help understand your life, yourself, how you relate to the world better. And see where you may be grasping or attaching in a way that causes you suffering. The result is that mind, when you develop these kinds of perceptions, whether it's one or more of them, you know, the mind becomes more focused on the Dhamma, it starts to let go quite naturally of craving and attachment, so it lightens up. Particularly when you're ill, you know, one of the sufferings of illness is the burden of the body. The body feels very heavy, whether you're tired or in pain, discomfort. But as your mind turns to the Dhamma and develops these perceptions, then it, oh, then it lightens up. You have know, this sense of you know, transcending or going beyond the, the physical symptoms of the illness. They're still there, but the mind is not bothered by them. It's focused more on the Dhamma. And that can actually help the healing process. The mind lightens up. And strangely, the body often responds well to that. The recovery process is often better. Or even if you're in the last stage of your life, the mind is more peaceful going into the end of the life. And we all have to die sometime. So don't get too caught up in wishing to have no thoughts in your mind. The Buddha more encouraged us to train thought wisely, train to be content with what you've got, your own set of candors, your own body, your own feelings, perceptions, thoughts. Contentment is a big part of the practice, developing that. So for monks living in a monastery, we begin our practice of contentment, just learning to be content with the basic requisites. And that requires some wise reflection. You know, every day we reflect on the food that we eat you know, with gratitude to the laity who support us, reflecting on why we eat, you know, eat food just to <coughs> keep the body strong for another day, keep it healthy, strong. And developing that sense of just being easy to look after whatever food comes, appreciate, appreciating that and eating it mindfully. Same with robes, same with the accommodation and the med whatever medicines we have. Learning to be content with what comes our way and to be easy to look after. This is sort of the beginning of monastic training. But you need to th think that through. But as you do, you realize, oh, this is very supportive to meditation. If you really do want to experience states of deep samadhi where thought does fade away, well, first of all, you've got to let go of your attachment to the four basic requisites and all that craving that forms around food and 
possessions, because it can be a big deal in the mind. Ajahn Chah, right to the end of his life, taught the monks to abandon a lot of greed and obsession with material world. He himself, right to the end, he had a very small little room that he lived in that was always empty of furniture and possessions. He had a wooden kuti, two-story kuti in the monastery. You can still go and see it today. You were not allowed, probably not allowed to go upstairs where he stayed, but he just had a very small little room, three by three, that had just a simple mattress and a, a few basic possessions in there. Downstairs was where he taught people who came, came to visit, and that was empty. So he never, he was never one who accumulated a lot of possessions in the monastery he built. You know, it's a functional monastery. He just built the buildings so that they work to protect people from the weather and you know, wild animals and so on. But he didn't build ostentatious, large, refined, artistic buildings. You know, they, they were more functional buildings so that people could focus more on the practice. And he encouraged monks to live simply to be practical. Obviously, you do need to build certain things and develop the monastery, but not to get obsessed so it becomes an end in itself. Because the monastery, the physical monastery, is a place to practice developing the mind, and developing the Dhamma for realization, for liberation. So he was an example of that. So any monk who lived with Lumpur Chao got that. You, know, you you just learn to be content with the food, the accommodation, what comes your way. Then when you sit down to meditate, there's a lot less bothering you. You've already developed that perception of contentment, letting go of greed, seeing the impermanence of things. You, know, you, you eat food and you're aware, oh, this meal will last 20 minutes and then it's gone, <laughs> finished. No need to get too obsessed with it, too caught up in it. So when you meditate, your mind settles down quickly and easily. So the monk's life is mixed and, and bound up, you know, mixed up with these perceptions. You're developing them all the time. Seeing impermanence, not self. Abandoning, seeing the danger in attachment. Cultivating anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, and so on. And to a certain extent, that involves thinking, but thinking wisely, using thought to understand and develop wise perceptions, and they they already have a liberating effect on the mind. So don't be afraid to use wise thinking, skillful thinking in your practice. But it's something you have to train. Come back to, as you're doing other things in your life, you know, watch how your mind reacts. You know, we like pleasure and success and the things that, when we get what we want, we like that and stimulate certain trains of thought, certain moods. When we don't get what we like, we go into the negative reactions, the despair, the disappointment. But you know, come back to the, developing these wise perceptions. It's impermanent. It's not self. Develop the perception of letting go. It's just as it is, isn't it? You know, sometimes you get what you want, sometimes you don't. When we are not training our mind very much, then we tend to be just always running with craving. And it's like you're always on the run and what, you're trying to get away from things you don't like and running towards what you do like. Mentally it's very tiring and, and it's just constantly bringing discontent. 
You know, when you bring up these perceptions, as the Buddha pointed out in the Giri Mananda Sutta, oh, craving starts to shrink away. It's not so important. You don't have to always get what you want. You don't always have to run away from what you don't want. You just observe and learn from these experiences. Ajahn Chah always used to, also used to encourage patience, endurance, which helps. When you're patient, then you're, you can reflect and develop these perceptions because you're being patient with a situation rather than rushing into some reaction to it. I like it, I don't like it. You'll be patient. Then you can really learn about yourself, how to let go. Maybe I'll leave you with these reflections tonight.